maybe I wasn't meant to have a regular life. And who am I going to be now? I get to wake up every day and know that I don't have to adhere to a routine, but I can do whatever I want. I can be whomever I want. I can nap in the afternoon if I want. I can write. I can go outside and be creative. It's changed everything. From The Totem Project, this is Full Moon Women, a community and a podcast about the inner lives of women. On today's episode, we dive into the story of Jake Kaiser. Jake's story is about reinvention. It's a story about looking bullshit in the face. It's a story about healing and about walking into the unknown. And it just might include a scene of a goat giving birth, but you'll have to stay to find out. I'm Jamie Younger, your host. Full Moon Women is a platform for women's voices and stories. We started the show because we believe women's inner lives matter. Our desires matter. Our power and our freedom lies in telling our truths to ourselves and to one another. If you believe in all that, I invite you to support what we're creating here by joining the Full Moon Women community on Patreon. When you join, you'll receive beautiful, unique, extra content from me and all of our show guests. Just go to the show notes and click on the link that says Patreon and join us. On this podcast, we publish episodes in couplets. The first episode in each couplet is a woman's story, something very personal from her inner life. It's a long form narrative piece. And then the second episode in the couplet is a conversation with someone who can give us a greater context and hopefully a greater appreciation for the storytelling woman's story. Today, we hear Jake Kaiser's story, and in two weeks, we'll hear my conversation with Marianne Cantwell, the best-selling author of the book, Be a Free-Range Human, Escape the 9 to 5, Create a Life You Love, and Still Pay the Bills. In 2011, Jake was at the helm of her own high-powered PR firm and spending her days in stilettos and attending charity galas. At the age of 38, she hit rock bottom. She'd endured a failed marriage and a series of miscarriages. The only thing that gave her comfort was the fantasy of moving to the country. At the time, she was living a big city life. I was living in Tampa, and I was living in a a very chic area of a town called Hyde Park. And we had a loft made out of an old bread and cake factory. And I was running my own marketing and PR business. I was 37. I couldn't wait to be a mom and a wife. And it was the dream that I just felt absolutely entitled to biologically. Being a Southern woman, I just felt it would just happen one day. And that was a fact in my life. I wanted, I wanted to have my own. I wanted to adopt. I wanted to, you know, help orphans. I loved the idea of motherhood and being a mom and all that came with it. Jake had a string of boyfriends and a super busy career. She was in her late 30s, and she was doing all the things. Well, my social life was amazing. There was a lot of travel. I made great money, so there was a lot of shopping, and I frequented Saks all the time, Saks with Avenue. I, I really liked to be catered to. I had a huge group of friends. I had a thriving business, a man I loved, and... It was a great life, but it was incredibly full of anxiety. Every single day, I just, I lived with anxiety because when you have your own business, you don't clock out at five on on a Friday. As a reminder, Jake was living in Tampa and had her own public relations firm. Have you ever heard the term 
uh, Sunday fun day. That was never accurate for me. It was a horrible day because I knew that my real week started the very next day. So I had to prepare clients call and text and email all hours of the day. I had international clients and no one cared about being on vacation or being a weekend. I had clients who would, one in particular, who at 11 p.m. Christmas Eve needed a bunch of work done for the next day. So I stayed up all night and I'm like, yes, I can do it. Mine was, I was the yes person. And if I didn't know how to do something, I would figure it out. I was going to make that happen. I had a deep desire to please other people and to not fail them and rescue them always. If I made people happy, then yes, it was a little fulfilling, but it would only stave off the intense anxiety for a short period of time. It was like shopping or any other distraction. In 2009, Jake started blogging as a way to deal with some issues in her life. Living in the city, I felt, and I don't know why this started happening, but I started realizing and having a fear that I'm reliant on millions of other people. I'm reliant on the water company. I'm reliant on the grocery store. I'm reliant on people for everything in my life. And that started giving me more anxiety. I started the blog and I thought, how can I bring a more self-reliant aspect into my city life? Because even though I loved where I lived, I looked outside and there's a tiny green patch of grass for your dog. And then it's a huge freeway, an expressway right there. So my window seals were small. I couldn't really plant anything. I didn't have access to. So I started learning things like, well, I really love chapstick. I'm going to learn how to make this myself. And it opened up an entire world of knowing that I can do anything if it's in a grocery store. I can do it at home. And that gave me a little bit of power, a little bit. So Jake starts doing these small sort of self-reliant, self-directed projects. Here's how you make almond milk. And did you know almond milk isn't really this thick stuff that you buy in the grocery store? It was along those lines. Just started learning and frequenting farmer's markets. And I was very drawn to these things. And I was confused as to why. Looking back, that's that need for self-reliance was a need to have a little bit of control, to take control back into my life and feel empowered. And it was all in an attempt. I had been soldiering on in my life for so many years through trauma, you know, because you just you just keep going on. You just be a good little soldier and you move on. You don't look at that trauma. You just push it away. You just push that despair away that depression away. I asked Jake what traumas she was referring to. I knew she had suffered from several miscarriages, but I wasn't sure if that's what she meant. She told me, yes, the despair and depression she had were responses to a string of very challenging miscarriages. I was in Tampa for 16 years, and I believe you're referring to the last miscarriage. Um, I did not have health insurance, and I ended up, you know, the, every miscarriage was the same, whereas every pregnancy was different. Every miscarriage had the exact same symptoms of feeling alone all of a sudden. Um, and over the course of the day, I just climbed into the shower and, to, you know, was in a hot shower for several hours um, until it ran cold. And when the contraction started, it was very, there were very strong contractions and I ended up having the baby in the shower. It was devastating and shocking and I was holding a miracle and it was extreme emotions 
from sorrow, anger at God, devastation, and awe. Jake's partner at the time was with her. He hadn't wanted the child. The guy I was with at the time was laying on the bathroom floor, um, immersed in other things, but there for emotional support. And he actually was in awe as well. We were both shocked at the emotion that came forward. But there was nothing he could do for me. I mean, you go through that very much alone. I do think it shifted his perception because it, it was not a baby he wanted, but I did. And um, I think it shocked him into the reality of the gravity of what it was and what I had gone through, which led to severe depression that he could not help me through. So that's basically the thing that ended our relationship. Jake was grieving and felt very alone, and her life felt out of control. In addition to the blogging that she had been doing, she started dreaming up a whole other life. I started dreaming of farm life, and it was very odd to me. I would Google it. I had a spreadsheet where I put all this pretend, my pretend farm, my fantasy farm. I'm going to grow this, and I'm going to have these, and this is going to be the names of my chickens. I type aid my farm life in the future. And then it became this whole online fantasy that I was super embarrassed about to tell anyone. It was as if I was looking at porn. I didn't want anybody to know. And I, I felt like, am I going crazy? What What is happening to me? This, this is not okay. Um, I'm living in a fantasy world in my head. And it, it was kind of scary. If I'm thinking about it now, probably the loss of that motherhood really played into wanting to put my care and concern into another living being. And I would listen to baby chicks on videos online. And it was so peaceful. It was the only time I had any peace away from that anxiety. And I never wanted to get offline because of it. And so I just started. One day I started a spreadsheet and I'm like, I am going to plan my dream farm, even though it's never going to happen. I asked Jake what she had put in her fantasy farm Excel document. A lot of fruits and vegetables and animals that I would have no access to in this country. It was completely moronic, the things I put in there, um, you know, like things that I wouldn't be able to grow where I am. Like, I really wanted to have truffles and um, trying to think of some animals that I had no idea, but, but they weren't even here in the U.S. yet. I just fantasized and I let myself go into that spreadsheet and I would put photos of what I wanted. And that was so peaceful. Just momentary bits of peace. Have you ever done that? Fantasized a whole other life than the one you're living? I mean, maybe you're even doing that right now. Well, I was fantasizing a completely different life where, you know, it was my Disney in my head. I wanted animals to sing to me and I wanted to wear pretty dresses and bows and frolic and sing. <laughs> and it was nothing that I thought was attainable. And I figured I will do this one day when I'm retired. One day, the guy I was with that I had the last miscarriage with, this is right before I left him, I had forgotten the volume was on high on my computer. And I went over to look at some baby chick videos. And all of a sudden, it's blasting baby chick noises. And he just looks over at me. He goes, are you looking at chickens online again? And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. I had to close out. And I'm like, uh, that browser was just open just lying out of embarrassment. I did tell a couple close friends and I'm like, I'm going to do this 
one day and they were just kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, in your Pradas. And I'm like, yeah, totally. Despite her friend's reactions, Jake dreamed about this farm life for several years. You know, people get those whispers inside. And the truth is, they were pushing me towards a different life than what I was in. Now I know that it was my trauma. It was the past whispering. You have to change. I had to make a complete change and strip down everything. But had I known that at the time, I wouldn't have done it. I would have been scared and I would have just said, this is crazy. You're insane. But looking back, I believe it was my trauma and the miscarriages. It was a desperate need to get back to who I was. And I didn't even know who that was. After a few years of keeping up with her chickens in her Excel document, Jake drove to Mississippi to visit her family. I came to Mississippi to visit my father and my stepmother. I loved land. So when I was here, I would take my car and I would just go drive around looking at real estate and I would fantasize about these cute little country homes. And one of them had been abandoned and I would get out of my car and go sit on the porch and watch. And it had a beautiful little creek and it had an old porch swing. And I would sit there in the silence and just listen to the wind come through the trees. And it was poetry. And I finally confided in my stepmother. You never, ever tell her what you want because she's going to make it happen. And I don't care who you are. She's going to she's going to put you on that path. And she's like, "What? well, what do you want? I said, well, and of course, everything I wanted was ridiculous. I want to be on a hill. I want to have a house in the fireplace. I want to have a pond, you know, a, a pond on a hill. Right. Um, I want fruit and nut trees that are producing and an outbuilding for a barn. Well, I went back to Tampa and within weeks, she calls me and she goes, I found a farm for you. And I'm, I'm like, what is happening? And she said, well, there's another offer on it. So if you want to see it, it checks off all the boxes. Um, you have to get here tomorrow. They'll hold it for two days before they accept the offer. So I got in my car the very next day, booked it up 12 and a half hours to Oxford, Mississippi from Tampa and she took me to go see it. And my immediate reaction was, this house is atrocious. I would never live here. But as I walked around, there were trees being overtaken by vines. It needed love, but everything I wanted was there. As much as I hated the house, I didn't want to leave. I just wanted to sit by that pond and watch the dragonflies and soak in the quietness. That was something I wasn't used to. And my stepmom goes, okay, you need to decide right now because they're going to take that other offer. And I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And then the thought occurred to me, I, I don't have a man anymore. I, what am I waiting for? Everybody else's life was going on except mine. I felt like I was trapped in a fishbowl in the city. And I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm doing it. Yes. And then I scared the crap out of myself. Uh, went back to Tampa, packed everything I owned up, and I was moving into that house within three weeks. As a high-powered career woman, Jake based a lot of her self-worth on her outward image and glamorous lifestyle, replete with great shoes, bags, clothes, you know, nice shit. And of course, an impressive social life. In the process of packing up all her stuff, 
she came up against some really hard emotions. I told very few people. I did not tell clients. Uh, I was embarrassed that I was doing it. There was no pride, no excitement at that time. Also shame from moving to a state like Mississippi, which is just universally hated on. And I knew I could easily lose friends and clients not being a city person anymore and living in rural Mississippi. Just absolute fear. Because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I had never touched a chicken. So Jake arrives in Mississippi with all of her designer clothes and her Excel document filled with her fantasy farm details. And she's creating this new opportunity. And yet she is trying to keep her old life going too. She sets up a Facebook page for her new venture and she calls it Gucci to Goats. She's spinning all the plates and kind of in this middle place between starting a new rural life and maintaining her city girl image back in Tampa. I didn't fit in with anyone. I dressed differently. I spoke differently. I probably looked down on people. Um, so there was absolutely shame and fear of being judged. My entire life in Tampa from clients. I mean, why would they want to work with someone in Mississippi? When, you know, they wanted a city person. I did not change my social media when I started my Gucci to Goats Facebook page at the time. I did not say anything about who I was or where I was. I just would post things. I was very quiet about it. And it took a couple of years, maybe three years before I actually came out of the closet about moving to Mississippi to be a farmer. The whole first year, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. And part of why I was so quiet was. I figured if this doesn't work out, if I fail, no one will know and I can go back to my life because it wasn't unusual for me to be traveling or not see people for a little while because I was busy. So I figured I could pull it off. After a little while, Jake started to find her groove, her farm groove, that is. Probably a year into it, I started to really relax and enjoy it and immerse myself into learning a whole new lifestyle. It's very busy and it's daunting and doing it by yourself. I mean, I'm not a physically strong person, but I had always gone to the gym. Well, that changed. Um, I was doing farm work. My, my nails were turning into a mess, even though I was, you know, had always been on point with my Manny and Petties. Um, all of my city clothes. I was not prepared for winter and seasons at all. My yoga pants did not fight the winter chill. Everything was different. I had never started my own fire in a fireplace. I didn't have a fire starter. Like I wasn't cheating. I learned everything the hard way. And in some ways it was exhilarating and in other ways it was really stupid. I was imagining Jake getting up in the morning in this old cold farmhouse. She had been used to ordering to-go lattes in her high heels, but not now. I wondered if besides feeling stupid and exhilarated, if she felt lonely. You know, I could see my friends and other people on social media doing all the things I used to do. And I'm like, everybody's just going on and I don't matter. So, yeah, I always loved New Year's Eve. It was a big deal to me, you know, ending something, starting something new. And here I am on, on my couch by myself with my little dog. And it was a difficult pill to swallow knowing that people didn't know or notice that I was gone. Jake had told a few of her close friends the real story. One of her closest friends came and visited and told her, I give this two months. I said, all right, we'll see. Because I couldn't disagree with her. At the time, I was very new into it and I hadn't gotten all the animals and it was cold and quiet and it was scary. It was hard to sleep because it was so quiet and the coyotes and 
so dark. There's no lights. There's no street lights out in the country. So I was horrified. I mean, everything, you know, in the dark, everything's worse. Jake moved to her farm on November 9th, just as winter was creeping in. She did her best to start fires in the fireplace, but frankly, she was no match. I know that was a terrible joke, but really, she had no idea what she was doing. I tend to be hard-headed and learn the hard way with the fire. Some things didn't even occur to me. I did not realize that I wasn't using seasoned wood to help start the fire. I was using, you know, freshly chopped wood and it was very difficult to keep it lit. And I'm like, this is exhausting. I'm moving off the couch every few minutes. I keep throwing paper. I was an idiot. (laughs) I should have gotten help. I should have asked someone, but I was going to do it. I was going to figure it out. When you first move out into the country, those people aren't exactly interested in getting to know you. They're very private. And I felt like, well, I'm educated and I can do this. I don't need them. But eventually some things would happen where I didn't hesitate to to contact the women around who would send their husbands over to help with something. I didn't have tools. I didn't know how to use them. I had a cat that was living there before I got there. I thought she was just fat. The neighbor's like, oh, no, girl, she's she's about to have babies. And I'm like, what? That is not on my farm spreadsheet. Jake is so funny. But the thing is, she really was that type A about the whole thing, at least in the beginning. She had a plan, and her plan included shopping for chickens. I actually ordered them, which was probably the most exciting shopping trip ever online. They arrived in December, and man, was I afraid. It was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Am I going to kill these babies? I mean, I was very self-conscious about everything I did. And then people started giving me animals which, you know, was not a plan that I had. But I quickly realized that spreadsheet is just not happening. Yep. A lot of things started to happen that Jake hadn't put in the spreadsheet. And not just the extra animals that her neighbors were bringing over to her land. The farm was one thing, but the forest of her mind was another. Jake had successfully stripped away all the distractions She had stepped away from a colorful social life and found herself, well, alone. When your social structure has been stripped away and your distractions are stripped away and you're just sitting there with yourself and it's really quiet, they start to come in. The they Jake is talking about are suppressed memories. There were toys that would show up at the house because the couple who owned the home before, prior to me, had little boys. And the chickens would uproot toys or the cat would bring them up. I would find toys that really rocked me and I would just push it away. Or something would happen to an animal and it would bring up a trauma. And I'm like, this is just go away. I I always try to fight them and push them away. I didn't know if all the trauma that got triggered in Jake was related to the miscarriages she had told me about, or if it was also about something else. So I asked. I was molested as a child and then later on was violently raped by a stranger repeatedly, and I did not report it like a lot of women. And then the next traumas were clearly repeated miscarriages. And so I had a whole big baggage that I brought with me to the farm that I didn't plan to unpack. I just thought it would disappear. I I thought in regards to the children, this is my dream. I'm entitled to it. I'm going to meet someone and I'm going to end up having beautiful children. 
But as I started getting older, I was 38 when I moved to the farm. The trauma from being molested was really starting to creep in. I kept it quiet because he had threatened me saying he would kill my whole family if I told anyone. And when you're a little kid, you believe it. So I said nothing and I protected my family. The sexual abuse started when Jake was about seven years old. It was a close family friend and she never told her family who did it for fear of consequences. But 20, 30 years later, her childhood trauma had shown up in her behavior with friends and clients. There was a need to please people and be responsive. Like people could cross my boundaries easily. You want to call me at midnight and have a story written by in the morning? Sure. I allowed people to cross my boundaries all the time, and I didn't take care of myself because of it. I did not believe anything was related to those sexual traumas at all. But eventually, it was a tidal wave that just took me over, and I couldn't deny it anymore. I had to eventually look at all of it. When the wave hit and crashed, it took Jake with it. She had made this big, courageous move to leave her insanely stressful career and go somewhere more peaceful, to live a life that felt truer to her passions. But she still had to look at something in the face. I kept thinking, I can't figure out what's wrong with me. And then I started getting suicidal. I had been broken up with on Valentine's Day. I found some old sonogram pictures that day and it threw me into, I'm done. I'm done with this. I I do not see a point to life at all. Even though I loved my animals, I loved the farm. I was hunted and I couldn't function anymore. And I decided I was going to be done. I went down to my icy pond and laid down and was planning to end my suffering. And I wanted God to pay. And I thought that's the best way to make him pay. And somehow my dog, my farm dog, shows up and he's a great Pyrenees, bigger than me, and stops me. He just stands over me and he stopped me just literally laid down in front of me and stopped my body. And I started crying. I felt just exhausted and unheard. And no one would care. And I asked out loud in that freezing cold day, I just said, please help me out loud. and. Literally, in that moment, this hope that was not from me showed up. Just this tiny little thing of, I don't want to be 80 years old and mourning my motherhood. And it changed everything. That one, I closed my eyes and... I saw an explosion of what looked like stars or fireflies. And they changed into a butterfly. I can't explain it. I think most people go through their trauma and they work through it over years. This was just a realization that I didn't want to live that way anymore. Something clicked. I'd always gotten hope from something on the outside like, Oh, well, he likes me. Maybe maybe we can have a family together. That's hope from the outside. And that's devastating hope because you have no control over that. 
this was some hope that just, it was like someone just shoved it into my heart in that moment. And it completely changed my perspective. I went down this path of just being open to looking at all that trauma that I had refused to look at. And it didn't kill me. I went through all of it and it didn't kill me. I didn't die. And suddenly, because I looked at all of that, it's like the power it had over me, it gifted it to me. And it changed my entire life in that moment. Jake walked away from the icy pond and back into her house. Inside, the phone was ringing. It was a friend who tried to get pregnant via in vitro fertilization, and the procedure had failed. When Jake got off the phone, she noticed that she wasn't triggered by her friend's experience or sad. In fact, she felt happy. My perception had just been so changed that I thought, what a gift that I have experienced carrying a life and that some women never get that. And I no longer felt sorry for myself or bitter towards women who were pregnant or who had kids in the life that I should have had. Seems like society expects people to have these changes slowly over time. That's not always how it works. Thank God. Jake's new perspective was basically this. There is no perfect life. There is no Excel document that can keep your life tidy. There is a life, your life, and it's waiting for you. Maybe I wasn't meant to have a regular life. And who am I going to be now? I get to wake up every day and know that I don't have to adhere to a routine other than for the animals, of course, but I can do whatever I want. I can be whomever I want. I can nap in the afternoon if I want. I can write. I can go outside and be creative. It's changed everything. It's been freeing. It made me appreciate the freedom that I did not want. The freedom she did not want. The freedom of being a woman without children. It took years for Jake to appreciate. For as long as she could remember, she had been driven by a desire to become a mom. But it just wasn't in the cards. So she embraced what was in front of her. I mean, if I'm brutally honest, I started paying close attention to my friends that had children, both young and older. And I started realizing, wow, I have a lot of freedom that I've never appreciated. And, you know, they have to find sitters just to go have lunch with me. It just is such a more complex life. I mean, being able to see it from a perspective of not being bitter anymore and not um, just feeling sour about everyone that had something I didn't. I started to appreciate my freedom. I started to appreciate that I could be creative and have all this energy to put towards something else. I just didn't want to feel bitter and ugly anymore inside. It was as if I was wearing this coat of brutal sorrow. And it was just completely weighted down. And I didn't know I could take it off. And how easy it was. You know, I like to tell everybody the fight was years of pushing it down. Had I just allowed it and looked at it and not judged myself, you know, like especially with, you know, being molested or being raped or all the questions of could I have stopped this? Judging yourself. Did I eat the wrong thing that killed my child? Was there a piece of bad fish in something? And I did this. It was just letting all that go and accepting that life was going to be different. And I could overcome an unknown future. And 
a dream that was gone. And it was okay. But I would no longer mourn at 80 years old, you know, that loss of that life. After all the yearning and loss and disappointment and what ifs, Jake was finally ready to embrace her reality, a life that frankly was bubbling over with life. Like right now, last week, all of my goats, does, kitted, they had their babies. So right now, my days are really filled with, I'm going to go out, I do my morning chores, which take about 30 minutes. And then I come inside, I check emails or do whatever I need to do. I have breakfast and then I go right back out and I play with the baby goats and I love on them and I hold them till they sleep, basically trying to, you know, you have to tame them. And I pour my heart into presence. If you're like me, you might be thinking, so how does Jake make all this work? Like, how does she go from working night and day and making tons of money to talking to baby goats? It, it was designed as a hobby farm. It was an educational nonprofit. And to this day, even during COVID, people will come out and it's easy to socially distance on a farm. And I can still teach the children about the animals and how to respect them. Because a lot of kids want to chase them. And I'm like, if you want them to come to you and interact with you, you just sit still and they'll come right up. So I still do a lot of that education, you know, working with, you know, schools and libraries and mom and dad groups and individuals who want to learn this lifestyle. They want to learn from someone like me who is a city person. They want someone they can relate to. So I'm doing a lot of stuff like that. But the farm... You know, other than some food items is really, it's just my place. To, it's my creative canvas. When Jake was living in Tampa, Florida, as a high powered PR woman, she wore a lot of designer clothes. And as you know, when she got to the farm, she was freezing her butt off. So I asked her what she's wearing these days. In the winter, I pretty much have all black because they climb all over you. You know, it's it's dirty, especially this time of year. You know, we've had all this ice melt and it's muddy. So I have little muddy paw prints because they jump on top of my back when I bend over. So I, I wear all black in the winter. And then in the summer, I really do like dresses a lot. I don't like pants. I'm just not like, a, I don't have jeans. I'm not that kind of female. The one thing I did learn was I can never wear a long dress because I got a bee that got caught up in my dress a couple summers ago. It, it excited everyone because I was screaming like a little kid and running around and it did sting me. So I won't make that mistake again. Talking about the birds and the bees, I really had to ask Jake about whether she had helped any of her animals give birth. She told me about the very first time that she helped one of her mama does give birth to a new baby goat. Yes, yes. Um, horrific. I thought I was fully prepared through YouTube and I was not. I was by myself and about three o'clock in the morning, I heard her scream. I jumped out of bed, ran to her and she was laying there. I could see the contractions of the body and the baby was stuck. And I knew like I was bawling, snot running down my face, just absolutely scared out of my mind, knowing the baby's head was stuck and you should see the feet come out first like they're diving and the baby's head was stuck and she was looking at me and I'm like first of all this is weird you know the baby sticking out of the mom looking at me and when I realized she's stuck and both of them are gonna die if I don't do something and I couldn't yell for anyone I'm by myself I I knew I had to act and I knew I had to get, have the courage to do that to hurt her. So I just took the baby's head, 
cupped it and pushed her back into their mom, which, of course, she screamed, but she's laying there like she's not going to make it. So I push the baby back in, reach inside the, the dough, and I feel around the first side for the leg, which I didn't think I would be able to find it because I didn't know what I was doing. But I was a, I just kind of followed her little body down and pulled one foot out. And then I went to the other side and I pulled the other foot out and I waited until she had a contraction and I pulled that baby out gently and they all survived. I appreciate how far I've come and how just eight short, fast years ago, my life looked very different. I haven't had anxiety in years. Since that epiphany by the pond, whatever it was, supernatural intervention, I have no idea. But I was no longer angry and everything has changed. I was afraid of everything. And I don't have that anymore. It's gone. Now I just go out and love on little munchkins and chickens and I talk sweetly to my geese and they talk back and I have a beautiful life now that I appreciate. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Full Moon Women with the brave and stylish Jake Kaiser. I'm so happy to share that Jake recently wrote a memoir. Her book is called Daffodil Hill. It's being released this June, but you can pre-order it right now. The link for ordering Daffodil Hill is in the show notes. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please subscribe or follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you are moved by this story, I invite you to leave Jake a voice message. We would love to hear from you and so would Jake. Just go to the show notes and look for the link that says voice memo. You can ask Jake a question. You can tell her what it was like to hear her story. And if you do, we may just include your message in an upcoming episode. We really love to document and share incredible stories from women's inner lives. It's this community of listeners and believers who make the show possible by supporting us with a monthly donation. We invest a lot of time researching and finding and interviewing women about their lives. And then we spend a lot of time crafting each woman's story into a powerful episode that matters. I invite you to join us and make a monthly pledge. When you do, you gain access to exclusive content from me and all of our show guests. Just join by clicking the link for Patreon in the show notes. This month, Jake made a really funny video for this community. She gives us a tour of her farm and introduces us to her farm animals. That's live right now on Patreon. If you're already a supporter, just go to Patreon and check it out. And if you'd like to become a supporter of Full Moon Women, you can unlock that post and see Jake with her chickens and her goats. This episode was produced by Pete Herkmans and myself. It was edited by Pete. I'm Jamie Younger, and you have been listening to Full Moon Women. Full Moon Women.